I would like to show you now the, the global picture. What you see here, this is the international tourist arrivals in, in millions. So you can see we start at a very, very low level in, in, 19, in, 19, uh, in the 1950s. And we have, in 2014, we have 1.15 billion international tourists. Of course, this is not the full picture. This is international arrivals. In addition, we have local arrivals and countries like uh, US, Japan, they have, of course, and of course, China, they have an enormous amount of, of, inter of national tourists. So just in China alone, we have almost the double amount what we have here from international tourists, we have national tourists. So in total we, we, we can guess that worldwide we have maybe 8 to 10 billion tourist trips, uh, just to, to give you an idea what how much this uh, this is in, in total in the total capacity. So uh, tourism is estimated 5% of global GDP. Of course, you have different methods how to evaluate it. So one way is to make a, a direct assessment, but if you count the indirect uh, effects of tourism, this is, much, this is much more. And this is very much country specific, because not every country has developed a kind of, of, of good tourism infrastructure and could combine it to the, to the best optimum. So what you, uh, what, what you have here, this is just a regional comparison between, between different tourist regions and different, uh, and different years. So you can see we start here from uh, uh, in, 19, in 1919 and in 2013 we have more than the double amount and you still see the, 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 the core tourism uh, comes from from Europe, but then it's it's followed already by by the by Asia by Asia Pacific as well, and by by the Americas. So you can see that, that that Asia in Asia tourism is much more booming than in than what it is in in other world regions, and this trend is likely to continue with improved uh, wells in, in Asian countries. Uh, also that you have an imagination, so how much one tourist spends? So in average one tourist trip lasts six days and it gives you a daily value of, of 180 US dollars. So in total per trip you have thousand dollars uh, per, per one, one tourist trip and so uh, of course Again, you have country specific, so I think it wouldn't be enough for, in the case of Singapore, but probably it would be more than enough if you go to, to Indonesia or to, to, some other, to some other countries. Uh, the most important countries here in, uh, with international tourist arrivals, so uh, France was number one, then US, Spain, China, Italy, Turkey, Germany, uh, Germany, Great, uh, Great Britain, Russia, and and Thailand. Uh, this number doesn't tell you the complete story because national tourism is not involved. And for example, in in uh, Japan or Korea, we we have a much higher amount on on national tourists. But at least this can give you an an indication about the relative um, status of of tourism in the respective country. So. What you just see here, this is just a very uh, a flashlight of the last four years in in in, the, in Asia, and you see that the North East Asia, so not that is Japan, Korea, uh, China, and and Taiwan. Uh, so this is of course this is inside this region. It is the the, the core of tourism is coming, but also Southeast Asia. So the region we are just in now, it's it's you, you could see that this was really as uh, so the the gap was uh, was uh, was becoming less. 
So in total, we have we have a growth, in particular in Southeast Asia and in ASEAN countries, we have a tremendous tourism growth. So maybe this is a hotspot of, of, of tourism growth, and therefore we should like to consider. In fact, tourism is unequally distributed, and like we have heard in your presentation, maybe it's good that it's unequally distributed because uh, uh, we we don't have you know this this this. Ebola or MERS or, or whatever, we would have many more um, cases in this case. So I just prefer here to study of Arambari. So he just focused out three major tourist regions, and there in the Asia Pacific, you have also the appendix with, with, with Australia. So in a way, tourism is not so comprehensive, not complete, and there are wide, wide differences. So the global picture is still, uh, so if you go into every region, you find a lot of, of differences in, in each region. So in the following, I will just, uh, I will just refer to the, to the tourism supply chain and, um, and will just give you an idea what it is, but before I have even to start with the with the globe, with the value chain of tourism because this is somehow a little bit different and this depends very much on what kinds of tourism we have. We have many different kinds of, of, of tourism and we can say we can simply start by uh, by rural or ecotourism which there you do not need a lot of, of additional resources to start with it, but on the other hand, you don't generate too much value in such a kind of tourism. And you can say if you have this wooden kind of tourism like we are just enjoying now, which you usually use for, for business trips, it's a much higher uh, value generated in, in such kinds of, of tourism. But you have varieties that are even much more expensive. I just can tell you two examples. This is polar tourism, which had the highest increase as a, as a different kind of tourism. And even space tourism is the most expensive kind of tourism. So you, it, one trip can cost you more than one million dollars. And of course, it's, not, it's only for very few tourists. So, uh, and uh, what is very important that, of course, we don't start by zero. So every kind of tourism, it has its kinds of development. And, and usually, well, let's say in Austria, it's the tourism started with agriculture. So because we had difficulties in, in agriculture, or many mountain farmers, they did not have enough income possibilities. They found out that tourism was a good uh, source of income. And you can say you just uh, used the right track, and this was 50, 60 years of development. And in the case of Austria, it worked very well, and the, the rural uh, the rural communities could really develop well in due to local tourism. The income disparity is 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 not given. So in fact, you know, you can say you have more or less the same income on the on the countryside, like in urban areas. But you can say that the quality of life sometimes can be higher in rural areas than in than in in urban areas, and this is quite different to the situation I experienced, for example, in Japan or even in Korea. I think it's a, it should be a similar similar situation. The uh, the, the scales of tourism are also important because, of course, the value means you can. There is a simple rule: the more local the tourism, the more cheaper it is, and of course, it, it generates uh, less value. But the more you cover from local to, to to global, then of course you have much more value. It can be good and bad. Of course, everybody would like to to to, to earn from tourism, but just to to. to to, to give you an idea, so if you uh, if you develop tourism from outside, or as an example, uh, island tourism like you have in Fiji and the uh, and the Maldives, so uh, this means you you need all the, the the supplies for for tourism. You need to import it, so you have no local resources, or most of the resources are not local, 
And it means to, to just to start this activity, you have to really a proper working uh, supply. Otherwise, you couldn't do it. And, and just these small islands, they are completely independent. So the whole national economies are completely dependent on, on tourism. This also uh, guides me to the, to the wise use of tourism. And of course, if you read uh, touristic reports, everybody will just indicate what I did at the beginning. You have an enormous value due to tourism. But in some cases, you can have a lot of inequality. For example, when you have poor destinations and let's say local population is fighting with, uh, with resorts for <coughs> scarce water resources, and either you can use the water for for, for, golf, go, uh, for golfing and golf sport, which became popular in many areas, or you can give reference to, to more local uses. And, and this is a point for, for discussion. And, and in fact, even tourism can, uh, can increase inequalities you have. So it, if it's going in a positive or negative direction, so this cannot be said in case of Austria, which is actually my first reference basis. I can say the agglomeration of tourism, as so it really it, it increased uh, it increased uh, the value and allowed actually that uh, that this kind of activity can as so could be built out in in such a way. And now. I have prepared such a picture for you. So this is the, the kind of, of, of tourism supply chain. <coughs> and you see here different uh, compartments. You have here the kind of, of local products. Local <coughs> products can be, uh, it can be agricultural products. It can be fish, cheese, honey, herbs, local greens, but also wine, beer, cognac, or champagne. Uh, and this can be this can become a basis of uh, of tourism. Then, of course, these are not let's say this is a, the second level uh, of of products in the supply chain. This would be then the, the all the things you need really to perform the, the, the tourism ski lifts, its tourist facilities, restaurants, bars, nightlife, shops, taxis, buses, transportation but also waste, garbage re uh, removal, or communal services. And in fact, tourism can help you to, to improve in, in some countries these kind of facilities to learn more about it. And you can use a lot of these positive aspects also in developing infrastructures. In the center, you have the, the core uh, tourism business. This is the intersection between, you can say, the local, uh, the destination, based management and the international or the over the, the management this is outside the des destination. So we have destination managers, we have hotel guest houses, campings, or also homestays and and other forms as of which we most directly connect to tourism and the overnight and the consumption of the hotel night or guest night, this is a, a camp this is I consider this as a core activity. Then we can differentiate be, between so-called customers of these uh, local destinations. So this means that it's regional to, to global tour operators, travel agents, airlines, railways, internet platforms. And finally, the consumers are the tourists. So they, uh, there are different ways how to do it. So either the consumers go directly they, the large tour operators usually they, they have their, their sales agent. They, they don't go directly to the tourist resource, but if it's a locally grown tourism, very often you do not have the sales agent, and this is particularly true for Austrian tourism. So for many sales agents, it's not enough. Uh, sometimes it's not enough business in it. So, uh, But on the other hand, it's more direct if we consider it as a, uh, as a benefit for for local uh, for local people so from from the consumer of course the information flows goes from 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 global to local and the service flows go from 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 local to uh, from local to global um, 
The, the aims of this paper is also the oldest improvement of information and service for, uh, flow, so that means all partners involved related to the supply chain structure, which can have various um, structure. I don't need to explain you because all of you have, have uh, done your homework and you know what is involved in the supply chain. Then we have uh, uh, business processes, management components, and this, of course, will remain, but what is very new to this, this is to include disaster and climate resilience into tourism supply chains. Through increasing resilience of tourist destinations, and we have regional programs, we have risk financing mechanisms, but also we have a lot of possibilities which are inside the destinations. And from here, I will go further to, to, to the disaster part and I will just show you this is the World Economic Forum in Davos and they, they, they just defined the five major disruption triggers for tourism industries. So we are really on the right track. So we are dealing with natural disasters and additionally because extreme weather was previously in natural disasters they decided, no, it's too important itself, so we should make it even, we should have two categories, and even because uh, we have then, we are dealing with the, previously only with the most important uh, category, now we are dealing with the two most important categories. So I think our approach and uh, the, the book project is really in line with, with, with this idea. Uh, just to simplify all the risk what we have heard now from, from you and previously, uh, this is a kind of, of uh, tourism risk metric. So I compiled several risks I could, could find into, into these four kind of categories. What you see here on the, on the left side, this is natural disaster. So it, this is actually the core we are dealing with. So we have climate related natural disasters. Uh, extreme weather events, uh, extreme precipitation, floods, droughts, desertification and erosion. And we have coastal risk. This is tropical cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, windstorm, then tornadoes, storm surges, coastal flooding, sea level rise. And we have mountain risk. This is a little bit different. But this refers mainly also to the, to the Austrian situation. This is, of course, my, my core reference. And rock falls, landslides, mudslides, uh, then uh, debris flow. Then we come to the geophysical kind of, of risk. It's earthquake, tsunamis, volcanic eruption, and meteoritic clashes. The first three categories, we, we, we have spoken a lot about it. And usually, you can say uh, low probability, high impact categories when we have the, the disaster um, database, we find most of the categories here and very few here, but in the cause of impact, so to speak, the, uh, the death of people, this is the category which is most, uh, which is really serious and, and most severe. Then uh, another, so what, uh, what you just heard, I saw, uh, what, what you were just referring to, this is man-made uh, technological, uh, technological risk, and this was a kind of, this is all the, the health <coughs> impacts. In total, the numbers I found, the health impact in general, they are much less than from, from, the, from this kind of category. So in terms of fatalities, this is, this is 10 times or more than 10 times more than what, uh, what is in this category. From the, from the health risk. Uh, Besides health, we find terrorism and war. You have heard about just now in, in Tunisia there was uh, uh, okay, this uh, terrorist attack and of course this will disturb uh, uh, tourism there and of course it's also for uh, economic disruption these attacks was, uh, was done. Then human rights violations uh, I just need to soccer, soccer world championships and all what you hear about Qatar and Nepali guest workers, so this belongs to this kind of category, uh, inequality, 
in society, criminal acts, but also strike, labor dispute, or financial system collapse, or let's say just now we squeeze, so people were just warned, please take enough cash with you because the, the ATM machines are not are likely not to work. At least for the whole next week, it will remain, it will remain like this. And uh, pollution, contamination, and also it's, it's nuclear accident risk. This, so this was the, uh, the, the triple disaster of, of Fukushima, which uh, or Tohoku, a disaster which you referred uh, yesterday. And but the other kind is on uh, this uh, this category, which is very much to rich and poor, which also a lot of you just mentioned. This is the kind of risk abatement. And uh, uh, you can see the rich countries, usually they are quite good in this, and therefore the, the potential number of deaths is, is reduced just, just to a, a minimum. And of course, this is related to the, to the wealth and to the income. Uh, we have land use planning and hazard zoning. This is, the one, uh, this is one measure in this case. Then technical construction to counter risk floods. As a, so dams for flood protection, water reservoirs, torrent protection, uh, avalanche protection. We have improved resource management of water, soil, energy, carbon low economy, avoided deforestation, etc. No isolated tourism and, and maximized local value chains. So that means you use also agriculture and a lot of other activity which you find at the destination and few interactions with producer and consumer of the touristic product. So this all belongs in this tourism uh, matrix. Actually, I prepared them even in, in larger slides, but after I could read them even at a small scale, I will just pass, pass them here, but just for, for, for repetition. Uh, this is a quantitative uh, counting. I use the, uh, this, the CRED Center, which is, a, which is a WHO facility together with the, uh, the UN Agency of Disaster Risk Reduction and the University of Leuven or Louvain in, 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 in Belgium. And this is existing, I think, since it was started in the 70s. And this, since then, they, they started to collect. So I think if you start in the 70s, you don't need to wonder that the risk is gradually increasing because the reporting also starts to increase. So it's not necessarily uh, the, just the number of disasters and risk increase. It was just the, since what time you are um, you, you have the strategy to, to get the, the risk and disaster and disaster information. So anyhow, during 20 years, so I take the latest report in the last 20 years, which is 1994 to 2013, so all disasters of this period are included, and you have annually, in average, 344 disasters worldwide. You can see out of these, 43% are related to, to floods. Then 28% are related to, to cyclones. So this is uh, Thailand flood, for example, and this is what, what we had uh, the Nagres in 2008. We had in Myanmar, we had a very serious uh, dis disaster, cyclonic disaster, and only 8% are related to earthquake, tsunami, and uh, like uh, the Tohoku disaster. Then we have the 6%, we have due to extreme temperature. Uh, that means extremely high, but also extremely low temperature. So if you have in some African countries, Somalia, you have some snow and ice, and this can, uh, in this case, it's a disaster. In another place, it wouldn't be. 5%, this is uh, landslides, five, another 5%, five it's, it's drought. Drought is a little bit uh, difficult because there is uh, the definition of disaster and a lot of effects, they are not directly counted to disaster because it's, it's relatively long-lasting time. Then this is fires, and of course this is also drought-related, and 1% is, is volcanoes. So this is the kind of disaster overview. And 
uh, how we deal to all these kinds of hazards and disasters and in this case we just have we have different concepts of vulnerability so uh, in the literature you you basically find four different kinds of, of vulnerability the first is, is structure the structural vulnerability and if you read about IPCC reports so mainly it's referred to structural vulnerability and this means exposure, and uh, uh, this is uh, location-specific vulnerability, and the uh, constructions for safety provision, they can reduce this kind of, of vulnerability. But this is only one kind of vulnerability. The second point is the so-called institutional vulnerability. So if you don't have any agency in place, this is the, or if, let's say poor countries in general, they don't have so sophisticated me uh, measures, then we speak about institutional vulnerability, and usually this is also setting up of uh, a destination, a hazard zone mapping, so that uh, a, a destination, usually a municipality knows, okay, what are my hazards, what, what is relevant to my, um, to my, uh, for my people, because not everything is relevant everywhere. And then we have this kind of economic uh, of economic vulnerability. So this is just what we heard yesterday from 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 you. This is the private risk insurance and the national disaster fund, and of course also supply chain management. So all this belongs also to to economic vulnerability. And the last point is that is the kind of, of social vulnerability. This was developed in in US. I think you made a special um, a social vulnerability index, and that was each county, each of the four thousand US counties was developed in, and they were made time series. Okay, how did the structure change? So was there in migration, out migration, the class of people where they. Uh, Okay, well-educated people and less educated people. So this um, uh, social vulnerability index just explains you county by county what is the kind of the, the, the social background for a, for a disaster. And what I learned from this is that you can even be in, in states like US, you can have enormous differences mm -hmm. and this changes over time. So within 40 years period there were quite a lot of, of of changes. So having this in mind, I come back to, to our uh, supply chain. So here we have the, the supply chain disaster uh, consideration within and outside of the tourist destination. So we have one to three. This means the in destination. Uh, so the, what we can do as a supply chain management is in the destination and three to five, we can have a supply chain management outside the, the destination. So some authors argue that you can do in tourism an enormous improvement just by supply chain management because you have so many different services linked to uh, in, the, in, the, in the tourism sector. It's just you, there are just so many that you can just give examples and actually they were given so large tour operators where they made some uh, uh, supply chain analysis, or what? Just what? What in Austria is not so unusual that uh, tourists go. Uh, what is now also doing with some apps like uh, Booking.com or or TripAdvisor, you just can go directly and you have a direct contact between the hotel and there you you can hop over the the agent and you. Okay, you make an improved. Uh, uh, you can uh, you can get the, the tourist product without an intermediate, and thereby it can get cheaper. Uh, it can get cheaper for you. In the local supply chain, of course, that uh, you can also let's say uh, in some uh, let's say in some countries it happens that despite you can have the local product, fish or fruits. They are not used from the local because they think the quality is not okay. You need super quality and you need to fly a team, whatever, in Indonesia from Thailand or something which is stupid because uh, you will not take your own value. 
So in this case, you can just target the supply chain in, in getting better local products which you can use for tourism. And in Austria, you have the so-called, it's called uh, Genus Region, which is means, uh, uh, it, it means that the whole region, the entire, it's authentic and you, whatever you can consume, it's a product of the, of the local region and it gives additionally added, uh, added value. So these are the, the possibilities you find inside and outside. So outside just because we, we have some references, we have we had the Hyogo framework for action which was relevant to 2005 to 2015. But after just after we met the first time, we had also the, the, the Sender framework for disaster risk reduction. So now the valid document is the Sendai framework and this is this is a plan for disaster risk reduction from 2015 to 2030. And uh, uh, we have, of course, the, the OECD, which for OECD countries, uh, as, a, as a reference, as an international reference. And on a regional level, for example, the European Union, they developed the, the plus flood risk. Uh, directive, which is an addition to the European Union Water Directive, and this is regulated since 2007. And I think a lot of measures can just taken from 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 this uh, from this document. And here I come. This is my country. This is Austria. And what you here see, this is uh, uh, 2,500 uh, municipalities, and each of these municipalities. They have to do. Uh, they have to do a hazard map. So uh, they get approved by the provincial authority, and and depending, you know, the payments rate, or that you get some payments, or even the, the insurance rates, they will depend on such on such hazard maps. So even the premium depends. I mean, on, on on where you would like to build it. So you give a value to the to the risk of the place and. And it's up to you and how to uh, how to, to to go further here. This is some example. We have different. We have so-called red zone. So the red zone is you can uh, from probability you can you expect a thirty a thirty years event of flooding event. So in this case you have a thirty years of flooding in this red zone. So everything you have here, every thirty years you will have a destruction here. And here, the yellow zone, this is every 100, or in some cases, 150 years risk. So this in, you can expect every 100 years. But due to climatic change, of course, we have a kind of, let's say, the 30, the red, uh, the 30-year the risk will become a 10-year risk, and the 100-year risk will become a 20-year risk. So this is somehow changing. This was based on rather conservative data from 60s, 70s, 80s. So the last point I wanted to present you, this is optimizing of, of uh, inside the tourist uh, destination. This was a particular uh, emphasis of the DG enterprise of the European Union. They wanted to give all uh, tourist destinations a tool to be more viable, to be more competitive, and just to have an uh, added value in selling their destinations against others. So, and of course, the climate-proof destination, this is one part of it, so there are more indicators, so I will just refer to the, to the indicators which are relevant to us. So this is a well-elaborated document, and according to my opinion, it's easily to overtake it also for for Asian for Asian destinations, and what to to set it up and to develop your your own things. So it's the sustainable tour. It's improved information for decision making, effective risk management, uh, prioritization of ec uh, of action project, performance benchmarking, improved community buy in, and support for tourism stakeholders. Enhanced visitor experience, increased bottom line, cost savings, increased value per visitor, so we are in again in the value chain. And uh, the purpose of system of indicators, uh, destination can be defined uh, 
okay, uh, geographic area, a place, uh, okay, this is just how you, uh, how you can define what is a destination. And in this case, you know, businesses, they are stakeholders in a tourism destination. So businesses alone are not the complete story, but they are uh, uh, really important, if not the most important, stakeholders of the region. And um, just some things businesses do not consider for themselves uh, that it is their, their task. Anyhow, you see here all the stakeholders usually involved in such a tourism destination plan. And they have uh, several indicators, so climate change is one indicator, and we can look percentage of destinations included in climate change adaptation strategy or uh, planning. And percentage of tourism accommodations and attractions, infrastructures located in vulnerable zones. So, some indicators like this, so they can go really in, uh, in, 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 quite, in quite detail. And we have something, this is, this is just developed. And here I stop and thank you for your attention.